Welcome to Haunted Talks, the official podcast of The Haunted Walk, offering ghost tours and paranormal adventures in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, Ontario. My name is Jim Dean. I am the creative director, and we really appreciate you joining us for today's episode. A very happy Canada Day to all of our Canadian listeners and to our American friends, a very happy 4th of July. Off the top, I do have some very exciting news to share. Since our last episode, we have now surpassed over 250,000 downloads. Thinking back to those early days of the show in 2015, if you had told me that eventually there would be a quarter of a million downloads of Haunted Talks, I don't think I would have believed you. We are humbled and thankful for you and all our loyal listeners. Here's to 250,000 more. It probably doesn't surprise regular listeners to learn that I am a huge Unsolved Mysteries fan. The landmark television series features the same kind of real-life mysteries that we enjoy exploring here on Haunted Talks. Hauntings, UFOs, dark history, fugitives on the run from the law, and other often difficult and terrifying unexplainable events. I've often wondered if Haunted Talks would exist or if I would have ever started working for the Haunted Walk without Unsolved Mysteries. It was a cultural phenomena, covering over 1,000 cases and significantly impacting not only how myself, but how countless other viewers thought about the world. With the series reboot launching July 1st, 2020 on Netflix, there seemed no better time to look back at one of television's most frightening and influential shows to see what made it so successful and to share what we know about the new episodes. But before we get to that, we have now reopened in all three of our cities and are giving our new bubble tours in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto. These small group experiences can host anywhere from two up to eight people from no more than two social circles, making these tours a safe and fun way to get out of the house, get some fresh air, and of course, hear some great ghost stories. I can't tell you how happy we are to be giving tours once again, and we would absolutely love to see you out. Information about our bubble ghost tours can be found on our website, which is hauntedwalk.com. I also wanted to give you a heads up about a major announcement we plan to make mid-July. And while I can't reveal any of the details yet, it is easily one of the most ambitious and creative projects we have ever undertaken. And people from all over North America will be able to participate. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all three at Haunted Walk. And I wish I could say more, but I will have to leave it there for now. An unsolved mystery, if you will. Finally, if you have not already, be sure to subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to us. And if you have podcast listening, family members, or friends who enjoy this kind of spooky content we cover here, we hope that you will recommend Haunted Talks. Unsolved Mysteries first appeared as a series of specials on NBC in 1987. Three hosts were used for these specials. The first was Raymond Burr, best known for playing fictional criminal defense lawyer Harry Mason. The second was Carl Malden, a well-known character actor who appeared in films such as On the Waterfront, A Streetcar Named Desire, and Patton. The third host 
was Robert Stack, who won an Emmy for his portrayal of tireless lawman Elliot Ness in the Untouchables television series. Based on the success of those specials, Unsolved Mysteries was given a regular spot in the NBC lineup. As the show moved on to its first regular season in 1988, Robert Stack exclusively took over the hosting duties. For the next six seasons, Unsolved Mysteries drew an average of 14.5 million viewers in the U.S., routinely cracking the top 15 shows on television. This, combined with the fact that episodes of the show were much cheaper to produce than other primetime programming, made it one of the most profitable shows on the network. In the early 90s, an hour-long scripted drama cost about $1.5 million to make per episode. Unsolved Mysteries co-creator John Cosgrove told the Baltimore Sun that Unsolved Mysteries could be made for 25-40% to of that cost. If you were the president of NBC Entertainment, which show would you buy? The one that cost $375,000 to make? and finishes 11th in overall ratings, or the one that costs $1.5 million and finishes in 40th place. In the fall of 1994, the network made the unfortunate decision to move the show, which was still performing quite well, from its typical Wednesday night slot to the much less desirable Friday evening slot. Viewership declined. Unsolved Mysteries' amazing NBC run came to an end after nine seasons in 1997, as viewership had fallen in half, with the show now ranking way down in 53rd place. Upon cancellation from NBC, CBS picked up the series for a 10th and 11th season, with each only consisting of six episodes and on a very erratic schedule, making it difficult for viewers to find. Not surprisingly, the ratings continued to worsen. A last-ditch attempt was made to revive the show by adding actress Virginia Madsen as a co-host alongside Stack. And it's interesting, when you look at the show's promo pictures of her from that time, it is really hard not to detect a very strong Dana Scully from the X-Files influence. The writing was on the wall, and the show was cancelled by CBS shortly thereafter. Sadly, cable reruns of the segments originally narrated by Madsen were redubbed with Stack's voice, making her in many ways a forgotten host of the show. After getting cancelled by CBS, Lifetime picked up the show and made three more episodes, which aired in 2001 to 2002 shortly before Robert Stack's death. Six years later, Spike TV repackaged the series and ran episodes from 2008 to 2010. Stack was replaced as host with veteran actor Dennis Farina. I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. This repackaged series run was criticized by fans for its presentation of past cases only, with no new case segments being produced. The existing segments were also edited to be shorter, so the show could be expanded to present five cases in an hour, rather than the four in the original series. Because the majority of the cases were now between 20 and 40 years old, the re-edited segments usually did not reference the years in which the events presented originally occurred. When updates for solved cases aired, Dennis Farina's voiceover would only refer to cases quote-unquote in a recent broadcast, when the case may have already been solved during the show's original run or during the show's hiatus from 2002 onward. Unsolved Mysteries ended its run on Spike TV on April 27, 2010. While the show's overall ratings were up and down, particularly in those last few years, there was a sizable and loyal audience that closely followed the program as it moved across four television networks over more than a decade. 
and it still continues to be a cherished franchise today, with the new reboot only made possible by the sustained interest from the fans. But why? Why do we love Unsolved Mysteries? I think it is because the show was so unique in five particular ways. The first way was the show's unique subject matter. The segments covered a number of sensational and tantalizing topics, including murders, missing persons, wanted fugitives, UFOs, ghosts, the unexplained, missing heirs, amnesia, fraud, and much more. All of them based on real-life cases. At the time, this kind of subject matter was not commonly found in primetime television. We have to remember that shows like Cops, America's Most Wanted, Rescue 911, The X-Files, and Dateline all came after and were clearly influenced by Unsolved Mysteries. Just as Unsolved Mysteries owes Leonard Nimoy's In Search Of, which aired from 1977 to 1982, a great debt of gratitude. While the topics could be quite dramatic, Even when Unsolved Mysteries presented alien abduction stories or paranormal encounters, it did so in a very serious fashion. While the camera angles, acting, and music could at times be considered over the top, the eyewitnesses and the skeptics themselves were always treated with an equal and somber respect. For the audience, this made the mysteries that much more appealing and raised serious questions. Could they be telling the truth? Where could they be? What has happened? Involving the audience was always an important part of the show right from the beginning. As host Robert Stack told us in every episode, Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. There was a sense that it was possible that unseen things were happening all the time all around us. And if we looked carefully, we could be the ones to solve a mystery. But we'll talk more about that a little bit later. Co-creator Terry Dunn Muir said the show's success was all about curiosity. People were fascinated by the idea that they might be living next door to one of these people, a missing loved one, a serial killer, a con artist, and that the viewer might be able to to help find them. Each show consisted of four segments plus an update on an older case. Almost every show has an unexplained death in it, Muir told the LA Times. Almost every show has a lost love story. Then we'll mix and match in there a legend or a gold mine, or we'll put in one of our UFO stories. The idea was to have four different segments in four different areas so people could always find something that they liked. Though host Robert Stack was, in show co-creators Robert Cosgrove's words, terribly proud of our contribution to catching bad guys, he was pretty skeptical of the show's paranormal and extraterrestrial segments. Perhaps the answer will come someday soon, when the skies open up over another small community and the blobs once again fall to earth. But even Stack found some stories like the Allagash abduction segment, pretty compelling. That one even nailed Bob, Cosgrove said. It got under his skin. These guys were so normal and credible and stood nothing to gain by making up their story. The Allagash abductions took place in August of 1976 in Allagash, Maine. Four men, out on a camping trip, encountered a UFO directly over their canoe one evening. The men frantically tried to paddle away from the object when a white, cone-shaped beam began descending upon them. The next thing the men were aware of was arriving back at their campsite, all four men calmly sitting in the canoe. The directional bonfire they had set right before they had encountered the craft was now nothing more in a bed of glowing coals. Where had the men been during this lost time? Under the influence of hypnotic regression, each of the men began telling a similar story 
of being abducted and experimented on by a group of spidery creatures in bodysuits. Stack and the producers found themselves equally swayed by certain supernatural stories. When we pick a ghost story, we were always mindful of those stories where there seemed to be a historical reason for there to be a haunting, Cosgrove said in the DVD commentary for the segment on the Black Hope Curse. I don't think any of us, when we started Unsolved Mysteries, really believed in ghosts. We've all had to take a second look at our preconceived notions after the experiences we have had. Initially, we'd be very skeptical of stories, but when you find there is a story, that there are facts and history and accounts from the past that match up to what people see today, it takes your breath away and makes the stories a lot more credible. The Black Hope Curse tells the story of a family in Houston who, not long after moving into their dream home, were approached by an elderly man claiming that bodies were buried in their backyard. Unsure what to make of the claim, the family started digging and soon discovered coffins and human remains. In trying to discover who these people were, the family came to realize that their house had been built upon an old African-American cemetery called Black Hope. The descendants were mainly former slaves. The last burial was in 1939, and as many as 60 people were interned there in paupers' graves. Shortly after discovering this, strange events began occurring all over the neighborhood. A dozen of the neighbors reported lights, televisions, and water faucets turning on and off, as well as unearthly sounds and supernatural apparitions. The most chilling incident had the family hear their patio door slide open in the night. And then, the following morning, the wife found her favorite red shoes, not in her closet, but positioned on the lawn directly beside the location of one of the graves. We can't talk about the popularity of Unsolved Mysteries without talking about its iconic theme music. And when I recently reached out to Robert, one of the co-hosts of Reenacted, an Unsolved Mysteries podcast, it was this eerie theme music that he immediately focused on. For every 999 out of a thousand people who watch the show, the thing that most quickly comes to mind at the mention of Unsolved Mysteries is the theme music. I know more than one person who cites the Unsolved Mysteries theme as the thing that scared them the most as a kid. And who could blame them? As soon as it started playing at the beginning of the show, I knew that I was about to be taken on a nightmarish journey of malevolent ghosts tormenting a family in their home, while a UFO lands in their backyard, and a criminal is breaking through the window. Even if the episode ends with a sappy reunion of twin brothers who are separated at birth, the end credits subject you to the theme all over again. So you have to go to bed with that music in your head, aware that any ghosts that might be residing in your house are coming for you. Even today, there is one thing I dare not put on when I'm home alone and it's dark out, and that is the theme to Unsolved Mysteries. Unsolved Mysteries' original fear-inspiring theme was written by Gary Malkin, who was also the show's main composer. One of the things that really worked was the music, Robert Cosgrove said. I had a lot of friends whose kids would run out of the room because the music scared them so much. Producer Raymond Bridges agreed, the music was so distinctive that you didn't even have to be in the same room to know 
that Unsolved Mysteries was on TV. But I say it's more than just the main theme. The music throughout the entire series is quite good and really becomes an essential component in creating the dark, ominous, and anxious tone that dominates the entire show. If you do a rewatch of the original episodes, I would highly recommend paying special attention to the music and how it is used so effectively. Another reason for the show's success was having real and believable people telling their stories directly to the camera. Robert Cosgrove said, The interviews were so important to the way Unsolved Mysteries was produced. People would think the most important thing was the recreations. But really, having articulate people who can summon up the emotions of what it felt like was key. You trusted the interviews, added director Keva Rosenfield. If you didn't have that, you didn't have a good episode. But let's talk about those reenactments, as they are pivotal to the legacy of Unsolved Mysteries. What was so unique about these dramatic reenactments that were featured with every story is that the eyewitnesses played themselves in a kind of retelling of the events. This really blurred the line between fact and fiction, and was one of the first examples of people playing themselves on television. In many ways, what we know as reality television today can be traced directly back to unsolved mysteries. Ironically, show producers gradually stopped this transformative practice once the show was making enough money to hire professional actors. According to episode director David Vassar, who directed over 100 segments of the show, in the early episodes, if there were any reenactments, we usually had the real people play themselves. That's why, he said in the DVD commentary, The acting of these first seasons, when we were just getting our feet wet, was not up to snuff. And as we went through the seasons, we were able to pay top dollar and get good people, so it just got better and better. And speaking of acting talent, if you watch Season 5, Episode 2, which originally aired on December 2nd, 1992, you will see Matthew McConaughey's TV debut as he plays a murder victim on Unsolved Mysteries. It is difficult to understate host Robert Stack's role in the success of Unsolved Mysteries. From being so well-known from playing legendary lawman Elliot Ness on TV... You know, for some reason, I don't know why, I thought there was something more to you. There isn't. You're just like every other hoodlum in those files over there. All they want out of life is a $100 suit and a roll of bills in their pocket. His hard-nosed federal agent persona was a perfect fit for the show, adding some much-needed gravitas. His poker face delivery and rich baritone voice could send chills up anyone's spine. I think there's definitely a carryover from Elliot Ness, Stack said in a 1998 interview with the Associated Press. Someone once said, You really think you're Elliot Ness? No, I don't think I'm Ness but I sure as hell know I'm not El Capone. As a viewer, during a particularly heart-thumping segment, it always felt like a relief to return back to the steadfast stack between segments. He was calm, cool, and always in control. But it didn't feel totally safe either. Wearing one of his iconic trench coats and moving in and out of the fog and shadows at some very eerie locations, there was always the sense that we couldn't totally trust Stack either. He always had another card up his sleeve. He clearly enjoyed scaring us a little too much. In my research, I discovered that most of Stack's bits were filmed on the grounds at the same Masonic temple in California, which is something I always wondered about. Stack was known around Hollywood as an incredibly decent and humble person. What you may not know if you only watched The Untouchables and Unsolved Mysteries is that he also had a great sense of humor and comedic timing. 
He has a hilarious role in the 1980 disaster spoof, Airplane, where he plays the straight edge Captain Rex Kramer. Now, one hope is to build this man up and give him all the confidence I can. Stryker, you ever flown a motor engine plane before? No, never. Shit, this is a goddamn waste of time. There's no way you can land this plane. Have all yourself. After Unsolved, he would go on to do endearing cameos poking fun at his serious and spooky persona, including in Beavis and Butthead to America and Basketball. All of us here are glad that such a terrific human being like Joe Cooper has returned. If I were a woman, I'd sure like to be his girlfriend. Walking in the park hand in hand, cuddling in the spoon position, our hearts beating in unison, staring into his eyes over our morning coffee. Okay. Yes, <laughs> yes, thank you. Undoubtedly, it was the mysteries of the show that drew viewers in. But one of the smartest things that Unsolved Mysteries did was including updates about cases in later episodes. The viewers wanted to know the answers and outcomes, and were thrilled when mysteries were suddenly resolved. It made for very satisfying TV viewing. It also helped fuel the fire. Not only did it create the perception that any mystery could be solved at any time, but also that viewers could play an essential role in helping solve them. For later syndicated runs of the show, producers were smartly able to add the updates into the older episodes, immediately following the original presentation of the cases. This allowed the audience to not even have to wait, but to get the update straight away. Not only was this structure helpful to keep viewer interest in the show, but also, and obviously, for those involved in the mysteries. According to the Unsolved Mysteries website, 50% of the fugitives featured on the show were eventually caught, usually with the help of the viewers. With 15 million people watching each episode, for a fugitive, being on Unsolved Mysteries was like being on the most seen wanted poster in the U.S. If criminals saw themselves on the show, they knew they were finished. As the L.A. Times reported, it was no mystery to Jerry Strickland and Melissa K. Monday when the police showed up at their door in Moses Lake, Washington. Hours earlier, they had been watching television as the show Unsolved Mysteries mentioned them in connection with an unsolved robbery and the slaying of a gas station worker near Pontiac, Michigan. Police got about 15 calls from area residents after the program aired, and Officer John Mays and Sergeant Dennis Duke arrived to find the couple waiting for them. In addition to the success in capturing fugitives, over 100 separated families were reunited by Unsolved Mysteries. Leanne Robinson told the LA Times that she ran away from her father's home when she was 16 and found her brother and sister years later through the show. Robinson said, I was standing there in the studio after the program ran, and this guy came over and said, I have your sister on the phone. I just started crying. I cried for over a week. To see fugitives caught and family members reunited were both very rewarding and a huge part of the show's success. While Unsolved Mysteries has not been in production for many years until quite recently, the tip line remained open the entire time, either through a telephone hotline number or more recently through the show's website. And that point nicely takes us to the new reboot, which is premiering on Netflix on July 1st as some of the calls and emails to the tip line over the years may be the inspiration for some of the new episodes we're going to see. My hope is that there is somebody that's out there that knows the truth. Give us a little help. That's what we're asking for. I kept saying there is something bigger. I'm going to find out. We may have something more sinister going on. All these years, we never spoke of it. It just doesn't make sense.
What else do we know? The creators of the original 1987 series, Terry Dunn Muir and John Cosgrove, are producing it, along with Sean Levy's 21 Laps production company, who are also the producers of Netflix's Stranger Things, which is an exceptional series I would highly recommend. So it seems like we are in good hands. There will be 12 episodes in total, with them being released in batches of six at a time. So there will be more episodes later this year, and I would personally suggest around Halloween would be a perfect time. The new version of the show features the same mix of true crime and paranormal phenomena, which I think has only become more popular since the show has gone off the air. But there have also been some adjustments for the streaming age. Rather than shorter segments devoted to several mysteries, Each episode will feature an in-depth examination of one case. The episodes will not have a host. Instead, they choose to allow their victims' loved ones to tell their own stories in a documentary-style format. The first episode is about a suspicious death. In 2006, Ray Riviera's body was discovered in an empty, abandoned room in the second-story annex of the Belvedere Hotel having seemingly plunged through the roof. While many assumed Rivera had jumped, others believed with a strong certainty that he had been pushed or thrown. With no history of mental illness, no sudden shock that anyone was aware of, it seemed impossible that Rivera had died by way of suicide. But it seemed equally impossible that anything else could have happened. Forensic analysis and physics indicated he not only fell off the roof, but took a running leap in order to reach his eventual landing place. And that's just the first episode. Asked why she thought Unsolved Mysteries has always appealed to such a wide demographic, co-creator Terry Dunn Muir said, It really does cross generations. It's amazing the different ages of people who remember the show. I think there's a relatable, what would I do in this situation experience. I think the stories that were always most frightening to me were the random crimes where the person is doing everything right and something tragic happens. She continued, referencing the beginning episodes of the show, Right away, we were solving cases. I think when we realized that we were going to be able to solve some of these cases through broadcasts, that made us really excited. And then doing the updates on those cases is what made people come back. They wanted to see what happened next. On behalf of myself and anyone else out there who considers themselves an Unsolved Mysteries fan, we are eagerly waiting to see what happens next with the series. In a similar vein, I should also mention that Season 2 of Jordan Peele's The Twilight Zone did come out on CBS streaming just recently as well. So getting Unsolved Mysteries and new Twilight Zone episodes virtually at the same time after a very difficult few months does feel like the perfect summer treat. For every mystery, there is someone somewhere who knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you. Thank you so much for joining us for the episode. Also a special thanks to Robert and Crystal from the Reenacted Podcast. Be sure to check them out and they can be found anywhere you get your podcasts. For information on our bubble tours in Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto, please be sure to visit our website, hauntedwalk.com. We'd love to connect with you on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all three at Haunted Walk. And if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and rate the show wherever you listen to us. As always, a big thanks to our Haunted Talks team, including Michelle Dennis, our outstanding audio editor, and Kevin McLeod, at Incompetech.com for the additional music. Until we meet again, sweet dreams.
The idea of a creature larger than a gorilla with an odor like a skunk might seem far-fetched. 